So Matthew chapter 14, and we'll be looking at verses 22 through 36. That's incorrect. 22 through 36. And this morning's theme is divine prayer. It is a subject that's, that can be very boring to talk about prayer, especially if you're not a prayer warrior <coughs> and you've never taken the time to pray. And so I'm hoping that this will enlighten you to what prayer is and how important prayer is and that it would really motivate you to pray more because there is power in prayer. But this is one of those messages that you kind of as a pastor go, oh, I know that not all of us are going to really hear what, what the Spirit really wants to say, but man, prayer is the most powerful thing that a Christian can have and probably the most important gift that the Holy Spirit can even offer. And we neglect that gift so many times. And so we're going to talk about divine prayer. <clears throat> what is divine prayer? It's basically a conversation with God. That's it. We have conversations all the time. I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't really like to pray out loud. I don't like to talk with people. But yet, we have conversations all the time with ourselves, don't we? I mean, more than anyone else, you talk to yourself. In your head, you're like, okay, well, I got to do that. I got to go do this, I got to do that, Reuben, don't forget this, Reuben, don't forget that, Virginia said this, Virginia said that, you know, and you're always talking to yourself. We do that all the time, more than, than talking to your wife or to your family or, or even to God, we talk to ourselves a lot. And so why not include God with that and start talking to God within your mind? He hears you. The devil don't hear you, but God hears you. And he hears you loud and clear. And so include him in that. In fact, last night, <coughs> as I was <coughs> just meditating upon the message, trying to get it into my head, you know, the picture here of Jesus going to the mountaintop, and, and then all of a sudden my mind would wander, and I'd start thinking, talking to myself over here about this and that, and I'm like, oh, i got to get back here. Okay, Lord, get me back here. And it's like I spent an hour just on one verse because <laughs> I kept going back over here talking to myself. So include God in that, in that conversation. That's all it is conversation with God. Here's some cute conversations with God from children. Dear God, my mom tells me that you have a reason for everything on earth. I guess broccoli is one of those mysteries. Dear God, please make my parents understand that if I don't eat salad, I do better in school. <laughs> Dear God, please forgive me for hiding my sister's favorite doll and please don't tell her where it is. Dear God, I need you to make my mom not allergic to cats. I really want a cat, and I really don't want my mom to move out. <laughs> That's a good one. <clears throat> I love prayer. I really do love prayer. I have, exp I have experienced um, some of the best times with the Lord in prayer, in deep, intimate prayer. I remember getting the gifts of tongues. And it was in such an unusual way. It just blew me away. And then I remember one time being in prayer. And I just wanted to sense God's love. And I think a, a young Christian <clears throat> goes through that phase where, Lord, just, I just want to feel you. I, mean, I know you're real and you've, you have done so much in my life, but I want to really feel you. I, I want to just know your love. And I remember his love just being poured on me. And it was so overwhelming that I had to literally say, now you need to stop. And I remember for the longest time thinking, that was such an unusual experience with the Lord. I wonder if that was just me. And I remember reading one of Pastor Chuck Smith's books. He was talking about being in the basement and him wanting to just experience the love and Holy Spirit of the Lord. And he described the exact same feelings that I, I had. And I was like, wow, Lord. I know that it was you now. Just confirmation. So... <coughs> But it all happens in prayer. And that's where we really need to get. So let's get into the text, and then we'll... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> we'll talk about these three points here in a minute. Let's get the context here before we start. So Jesus has already fed the 5,000, including, uh, uh, not including the, the men and the children. 
Uh, he sends the disciples away in the boat to the other side while he goes away and prays up into the mountains. We don't know what mountains it is. <clears throat> As he's praying in the middle of the late night, uh, a storm begins and the disciples are in trouble. So he gets up in the morning, Jesus, and he walks out on the water to where the disciples are. And at that point, Peter walks out to meet Jesus, and the disciples are so blown away by it that they literally acknowledge him as the Son of God. It was, it was an epiphany to them that this Jesus Christ uh, is truly the Son of God because of this one miracle and experience that, he, that they have with Jesus Christ. And then we'll end in verses 34 through 36 with the people of Genesaret. It's a hard word to, ex to express. And they're going to exercise their faith by bringing all of the sick and ill to Jesus Christ. And he will literally, he will literally heal every single one of them to display his power and authority. So three points this morning. Personal prayer, intercessory prayer. I thought they were going to have it up there today. <clears throat> intercessory prayer. And then the last is identified prayer warrior. So we're going to talk about those three things. Let's get the context here. Let's go ahead and read. Immediately, verse 22, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening had come, he was all alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. <clears throat> Immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter had come down, out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately he stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat and the wind ceased, then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. It's a good message on faith all, also, by the way, but we'll, we'll get to that. So it says that, that Jesus immediately, after feeding the multitude, immediately got the disciples and put them into a boat to take them to the other side. In the Greek, it's a strong term, immediately, and it really means forced. So he literally told them, get in the boat. And go to the other side and I will be there. He almost forced them to get into that boat. And the reason that he forced them was is because John tells us in chapter 6 verse 15 that the, some of the people in the crowd wanted to make Jesus king. He obviously fed them uh, with, with whatever it is that they needed and they saw that he had the ability to feed them and so they wanted to put him up as king. And he didn't want his disciples to get a seed planted in them that he's to stay here and be a king because his kingdom is greater than that. It's a spiritual kingdom. And so he forces them to get in the boat. And then he goes to the multitude and says, go away. That's what a ministry, right? Go, and that's your ministry, to send the multitudes away. I like Jack Hibbs uh, once when he says, I preach it hard. You know why? I've got so many people I want to get rid of some. <laughs> you know, so, so he preaches it hard. I like that philosophy. I can't do that here. I try to preach soft too many times because I'm trying to keep people. But that's not good either. <clears throat> so that's the reason that he puts them in the boat and says, go. And then I'm, I'll go to, to you later on. Now, I don't know if they understood. Maybe they guessed, well, maybe there's a boat around he can get into and he'll meet us there. Or is he going to walk around? Uh, they're not quite sure. But he sends them all to the way. And he sent them all to the way. And he went up to the mountaintop himself and he's going to pray now Jesus being God and knows all things he knew the storm would be coming he knew that this was an opportunity to pray before that happens and I'm sure that in that prayer he's praying about the disciples the situation he may have even brought it on himself some suggest in the other storms that Satan brought the storms because he wanted to kill Jesus and the disciples but in this storm I think that that 
Jesus is allowing it <clears throat> to come to teach the disciples faith and also to open up their understanding of who he is, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. So we have a, a, a neat picture here also of today, Jesus Christ sitting where? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's doing what? Praying. He's making intercession for us every single day. Isn't that neat? Well, we are here in the storm of life, unfortunately. And yet we have Jesus in heaven. That excites me, guys. I'm sorry. Not only did he die for me and gave me new life, but he went right to the Father, and he's there by the Father. You know what prayer is, speaking to the Father. He's saying, oh, Father, remember Reuben. Bless him today, Father. Take care of him. Oh, he's going to run into some things, but strengthen him. Here. I love that. I love that picture. That's true love, compassion and caring. And that's my Savior. <clears throat> so Jesus finds his quiet place, and he begins to pray. <coughs> he understood the urgency, and he understood uh, the purpose of prayer. So my first point is personal prayer. How's your personal prayer? How's your prayer life? Do you have a prayer life? If I were to ask, show of hands, how many would say, I have a prayer life where you pray on a daily basis? So many rose their hands. <clears throat> I love having a prayer life. That's where you get everything done is in prayer. Jesus was hungry for this time with the Father. He's been busy. He's been serving his children, feeding them with food and, and taking care of their knees and healing and all these things and then teaching the disciples. I mean, just pouring, pouring, pouring. There comes a point where you need to be poured in too. And Jesus was also fully man. And so he didn't want to neglect prayer. And so he went up to pray for refreshment. Be refreshed from the ministry and from life and the struggles. Someone said, refreshed by the presence of the Father delighted by his communion. And that's really what it is, is communion with the Father, where you have this one-on-one -on -one relationship and you pray alone. We don't know what he said. He probably was praying for the disciples. But looking at some of the other prayers that Jesus gave and also the example of prayer in the Lord's Prayer, I, I, he probably started off first with the Father of praise and worship. May he have asked for help with the disciples, meditation, and those are all good things to do in our, in our prayer lives. But prayer, as I said, is communication with God, and you can pray about anything. My first encounter with prayer was on a Wednesday night prayer meeting, and I remember this was the first encounter with open prayer where you were able to pray out loud. Never done that before, and so I was a little scared, but this young lady was there, <coughs> and she really ministered to me. As she prayed, she prayed for her cat, that God would just touch her cat and make her cat feel better. And I thought to myself, okay, that's a good prayer. <laughs> but I went away from that thinking, wow, to feel so comfortable with the Father that you could pray for your cat. That's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. And it taught me that you can pray about anything to God, that he cares about all those little things there. <clears throat> so it's good that we find quiet time with God. The world's not a pleasant place. Um, we have hardships. <clears throat> it's mundane. There's work to be done, and we really need our souls to be refreshed. According to uh, one Greek legend uh, of Athens, he described the importance of being refreshed. He was playing with a group of uh, kids some games and just having a great old time. And the gentleman comes up to him and says, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your times? And um, <coughs> Aesop says to him, if you were to take a bow and remove the string and lay it on the ground, what it would it represent to you? And the man says, I have no idea. He says, well, as you take the bow off and lay it on the ground without its string, it, it keeps it strong and it strengthens it. So when you retie the string, you're able to use its full force. So there's times of refreshing. There's times where you just need to, to spend time with the Lord's and be refreshed by the Lord. <clears throat> That's why we need to take timeouts. When we study the Bible <clears throat> on the subject of Jesus' prayer life, we find at least three reasons why he prayed. 
One reason was as an example for his disciples. And that's a good teacher. It's a good leader is to be an example uh, to those that are under you. And Jesus was that example. He wanted them to also have a prayer life. And that's why the apostles came to him and said, teach us how to pray. We want to know how to pray. And then you have the Lord's Prayer. The second reason is that Jesus was a human being. And good Jews always prayed. They always went into the temple. And so as being man and experiencing man as God, he also prayed. So he understands the, uh, the struggle with prayer. He understands how difficult it can be sometimes to get up in the morning and pray. And by the way, if, you, if you're not a morning person, that's okay. <laughs> pray in the afternoon. <clears throat> pray, pray in the evening. Whenever you can, pray. The Lord knows, and he accepts all those prayers. Remember, he's, he's an eternal being. It, where he's at, there is no time. So when you say morning, he's like, morning. Well, it's the same time here every day. <laughs> you know? So for us, whenever you can, do it. So not only is he human, but also he's deity. So as a, I would say as a requirement, He's duty-bound to be praying constantly in the Trinity because they're all in unity and in one accord. And we see this great prayer in John chapter 17. Beautiful prayer. Read it uh, afterwards um, where he's praying to the Father. He's praying on behalf of the believers. He's praying on behalf of those that would believe even after the disciples. It's a beautiful prayer. And as part of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, he's praying. And so he's a perfect example of why we should pray. <clears throat> in fact, in his Lord's Prayer, he said, Father, hallowed be thy name. It's the first thing you start off with, right? It is just glorifying the Father. The secret to prayer really is a matter of involving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be a part of that prayer. Inviting him to be involved in your praying and seeking of the Lord. Without him, prayer will avail nothing not avail at all because we need to be in the spirit and not in the flesh we must pray to god through the holy spirit in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ if you have a designated time to pray pray that the lord give you the holy spirit to illuminate the holy scriptures so that you could be effective for the kingdom of god if you do not then i urge you get a specific time Find a time and get into the habit of praying. You might start with just a few words. And, and I, I love watching new believers. Uh, we've had them here periodically. Uh, we used to meet in, in the classroom here before services and pray together. <coughs> and, and guys would come in and, and you would immediately realize, okay, they're new. They don't know how to pray yet openly. And so they don't say anything at first. And then within a month or so, I'll say, Lord, uh, you know, help us today. And just something simple. Then within months, you're like, man, come on already. We got to get out of here, you know, because they're now prayer warriors. You know, they're now in the, in the word. I remember Randy. He, he was exactly like that. Now I can't shut him up. <coughs> it's like, man, Randy, uh, he's, he prays for me all the time. And, he, you know, and it's just like, wow. And I remember him back then, you know, just kind of, okay, Lord, we're here. Just help us, you know. And he would help and do, do things. And now it's like, wow. But that's what the Lord does when you just begin with the little steps. Prayer should always include adoration to the Father. That's worshiping of God, confession of our sins, petition, you know, in <clears throat> others' needs to the Lord, intercession which are sincere prayers on behalf of others, thanksgiving, the expression of, of joy, what God has done for us. Prayers isn't always exciting. In fact, it usually isn't exciting. It's usually just ordinary. And you know what? Ordinary is okay. Can I, can I say to you that being bored is okay to be bored? but write some notes down anyway and take it in. Like eating peas, ugh. But eat a few peas once in a while because it's good for you, right? Or broccoli, you know? P 
prayer is kind of like that. I know there, there are times where you start praying and then you go, okay, I'm done, Lord, and you just go off. And we need to just do it out of obedience to the Lord. It's okay. <clears throat> Here's what I found. The main problem in developing a deeper prayer life is not in the efficiency of prayer or in the length of prayer, but in the commitment to prayer. It's in the commitment to prayer. Really, that's the main problem. Because it's not always, you know, well, how efficient am I in this? And, you know, we, we think about it, but really we fall off and we just stop doing it. It's really the commitment to it. Well, God never really answers. We'll just keep doing it. You haven't been committed enough to it. You need to be committed. Tori, Corey Tim Boone said, don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. It's a matter of just doing it. <clears throat> You see this <coughs> heartfelt prayer in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel chapter 11 with Hannah. And if you know the story of Hannah, she so much wanted a child. And she did not have one for many years and watched her husband's other wife have children. And this just affected her. She felt afflicted. She felt alone. She felt like nobody loved her. Nobody remembered her. And there's a prayer that she gave unto the Lord with a vow. And this is what she said in this vow. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant. You can almost just feel her heart because she had not a child yet. And she wanted a child so badly to, to bring to her husband, bring to the Lord, to raise as her own. For a Jew, that was a curse not to have a child. Now I'm afflicted. Everyone looks at me, and I can see their stares as though something's wrong with me, and I feel afflicted all the time. And then she said, remember me and not forget your maidservant. She says, though, God, you've forgotten me. Where, have you, where are you at? You've lost me somewhere within all the other women that are having children, and I'm feeling lost. I, I need you to remember me and answer. This is a heartfelt prayer, and she prayed it unto the Lord. And she vowed that if you give me this child, that I will dedicate it to you. And this was Samuel. He took a Nazarene vow, never cut his hair, never drank wine, was committed to the Lord, and the Lord used him in a mightily way because she had a heart for God. And it took prayer to do something like that. Jesus was alone there on the mountaintop with his father in deep communion, and the boat was now in the middle of the sea. And this is where the prayer works. So as it's in the sea, verse 24 it says that the waves for the winds were contrary were being tossed all over the place which is not unusual for Galilee there are mountains to the north side of it also to the north I'm trying to think how it's situated to the northwest side of it there are some huge mountains where the wind just comes down those mountain ranges hits the mountains comes back at the, at the water and just takes the water and just tosses it all over the place and in this case, the word contrary here is talking about a whirlwind. Now, this water was literally around the boat, just splashing and tossing them all over the place. And it was the fourth watch. So as Jesus was praying from when the multitude went away till 3 to 6 o'clock in the morning, he was praying. And at that time, he got up and he began to walk over towards the boat. We know that it was the Romans timekeeping because the Jews have three watches not three watches <laughs> and the Gentiles have four we're richer no. <clears throat> so it was a Roman time so early in the morning he gets up and he begins to walk on the water towards them now how do you walk on water that's a good question that's one of those questions that you'll never know until you get to heaven and you ask Jesus and Peter so how did you walk on water? How did that work? And you can only guess, you know, did your bodies change? Did the water change? Did matter change? I, who knows? I mean, it's probably something totally different. They were in a different dimension. I don't know. It doesn't say, but they walked on water. That's amazing, isn't it? Total, totally blows me away that they could walk. It's almost like a fairy tale. It's one of these stories you tell your kids, you know, and Jesus walked on the water. <gasps> really? He walked on the water? Yeah, and Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water too. <gasps> wow. And they're like, eyes are open. Don't you love seeing your kids' eyes open? My dad used to tell us stories. <clears throat> I don't know where he got this story. 
don't know if he got it from his dad. He never said. But he used to sit us down and tell us a story about a kingdom. And a king in his kingdom had a tree. And the tree would have diamonds once a year, about three. And only once a year the tree would have diamonds. And a dragon would come in the middle of the night and take a diamond away. So he would set up guards. And he'd tell us his story. And we were like, wow. You know, all, every night, give us some more. He wouldn't tell us the whole story at once. Just a little bit every night. And I told that story to all my boys when they were little. I don't know if they even remember. And now I'm telling that story to all my grandkids. And now I remember how my boys reacted because I've forgotten how they even reacted. But um, I was with Lu Luciana and I was telling her that story. And she, her, if you've ever seen Luciana, she is so gorgeous. And her eyes are just wide open. And she's like, really, really? And I go, and I'll tell you more later. She goes, no, no, tell me more now. Nope, you have to come over again. I, we don't get to see her too often, so. <clears throat> but it's like one of those stories, but it's not a story. This is reality. Jesus is literally walking on water, and Peter is going to come to him. Um, it says <clears throat> that the disciples saw him walking on water, and they were troubled, verse 26, and they started thinking, oh, it's a ghost. This is a demon. They didn't really believe in ghosts. They believed more that uh, they were demonic forces of some sort. I don't believe in ghosts either. I only believe in demons. There are only, there are only bad angels, which are called demons, and there are good angels, and there's humans, and there's God, and that's it. There are no, no ghosts. You know, there may be demons disguising themselves as people or relatives because they know us very, very well. And so they thought there was a ghost, and they began to cry out in fear. In fear there, and immediately Jesus spoke to them. Uh, imagine the water, the waves, the, the clouds, you know, and they're looking, and they're like, what is that? And they see a man walking, oh, no, it's a ghost. Not just a storm, but now we got a ghost coming at us. And I mean, Jesus, calm down, you know, be of good cheer, it is I. Now, it's interesting in the Greek here. What Jesus is saying, and it's emphatic, the I, and I mentioned that to you before. And when you see an emphatic word, it's really pronounced with force. And so what Jesus is saying is, be of good cheer because it's I, you know, it's me, I am. So he's, he's going back to the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 3, 14, and saying, I am is here. I am God, and I am in totally, total control here. So be of good cheer. And then Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, now it's interesting because he gets the emphaticness there, and, it, and we see it in his, because when he says you, it's emphatic also. So he's almost like responding to him like, well, if it's you, then have me come out there to you, right? I want to go out there. Th there's an excitement there on his part. I want to walk on water too. And so God, or Jesus says to him, come. And the come is a command word, and it means start to walk by faith out from the boat. So come, what's stopping you? I can imagine Peter like, <laughs> it, was he kind of like this, you know? Okay. <laughs> you know, and then get out, whoa, okay, what's going on? It's cool. What, do you think he was like that? I don't know. I think the, I, some people say that Peter lacked faith here because he even had to ask. No, I don't think he lacked faith at all. I think he had all faith. I think he just got out and started walking out to the Lord. Now, we don't know how far the Lord was. And here's Peter. And he's looking back. Says, you, you ever have a perspective from the water to your boat? I don't think any of you have. Uh, we've had from the boat to the water. But from the water to the boat, that's an interesting perspective, right? And it's not this David Blaine thing, you know, put a glass and walk on it. This is real. <clears throat> and he's out there. So when Peter went down there out of the boat, he walked on the water and he went towards Jesus. And it says when he saw that the winds were boisterous because he's out there and now he becomes afraid. And this is where he starts to lose his faith. He starts seeing the winds and so forth and Jesus there in the boat there. And he's saying, what am I doing here? And he starts to sink. So he cries out the shortest prayer ever. This is intercessory prayer. <clears throat> this is Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Do you think that was heartfelt? Yeah. You ever jump in water? 
You ever jump in the ocean water? How many have jumped in the ocean water? I have. It's scary, isn't it? Especially after someone tells you there's sharks all over the place, you know, and you know, okay, that's true. And especially you see some of these videos where they're looking at the water and you're looking, and then all of a sudden you see this thing come up, whoo, and it's like this giant, you know, plank eater. And you're like, where did that come from? And, you, and they show you in the water how they come up and you don't even see them at first, and boom, they're there. I was on jet skis with Modesto <coughs> at, at Huntington, I'm sorry, at Newport Beach. <coughs> and they told us that if <coughs> the uh, jet ski um, died, just jump off the, the jet ski, go underneath, put your hand underneath, because sometimes stuff gets clogged up there. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> There's no way in my jet ski. Yeah, it, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. So it dies out. But that's was like way out there. I'm like, can you see me? Just enjoying himself. I'm like, come on, girl. I'm not jumping off this thing. So I had him, you know, finally he saw me and I had him tie a rope and, and we, he tugged me back to, to where it was at. It's not, a, it's not a, you know, I guess for some people it's a fun thing. But for me, it's not a fun thing to be out in the water, you know, with everything else that's out there. But there's Peter and he's fearful for his life and he says save me Lord and of course immediately the Lord stretches out his hands and he pulls Peter right out Peter's a big man by the way tradition tells us he was a giant and so you can only imagine how strong Jesus was before he used his divine power but I literally think Jesus literally as he's walking on water and Peter's sinking he grabs him up and said come on let's go back and they both get onto the boat <coughs> and that's when he says oh you of little faith why did you doubt? That's where the doubt was. So they got into the boat, and the wind immediately ceased. So there's a lesson there, right, from the Lord about faith, isn't there? About keeping your eyes on Jesus. Let me just say this about <coughs> keeping your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is in heaven, and he's making intercession with the Father daily on our behalf because we are in the storm. And believe it or not, we're all in the storm together of life. And there are good days, and praise God for good days, but there are a lot of bad days, too, that come. Especially as you get older, they come a little more as things start hurting. <clears throat> but don't ever take your eyes off of Jesus. That is the only hope you have for eternal security. No matter what life throws at you, don't take your eyes off Jesus. No matter how much you sin, and fail him. Don't take your eyes off of Jesus. I taught at a, <clears throat> a men's home in Paris. And these guys are all druggies, alcoholics. <clears throat> and that was my message. Don't take your eyes off of Jesus. Most of them, <laughs> you know, they're going to go out into the world. They're probably going to fall back into it again. It's just the odds, addiction, unless they really get delivered by the Lord. And so I told him, no matter what happens, don't take your eyes off of Jesus. It may come to the point where you're the thief on the cross. And you say, Lord, can you just save me? You'll be with me in paradise today. I've seen people on a deathbed many, many times. And they're gone. At that moment, I've whispered in their ears, accept Jesus they have and they're in heaven don't ever take your eyes off Jesus keep them on Jesus even if you start sinking notice what Peter did Lord save me I don't have the faith here and the Lord saved him he saved him because that's our God who is ever forgiving loving caring and compassionate and restoring that's our God so those who were in the boat <coughs> Some suggest that there might have been some others in the boat there. How big the boat was, we don't know. <coughs> but they all came over, and they began to worship Jesus, and rightly so. And truly, they said, truly, you are the Son of God. There's, boom, the light bulb came on. Truly, you are the Messiah. At this point, the disciples weren't quite sure. Remember, they were asking questions before, who is this guy? People are saying this person and that person, and we don't know who you are. And at this point, this man has control over creation. That's deity. You must be the Messiah. 
You are the son of the living God. You are the chosen one to deliver us. And he was an acknowledgement. And Jesus, I'm sure, just smiled like, yes, they got it, Lord. Praise the Lord. Intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer, <clears throat> real quickly. Intercessory prayer is a prayer that pleads with God for the needs and the needs of others. But it's more than that. Intercessory involves taking hold of God's hand or his will and refusing to let go of it until he blesses you. That's intercessory prayer. We have a picture of that on a Wednesday night we taught out of Genesis chapter 32 with Jacob. And we see this picture very clearly. Jacob's alone. He's in the middle of nowhere. A man comes in and he begins to wrestle with Jacob. We know that man to be God. And Jacob will not let go. That's intercessory prayer. He hangs on to him. He doesn't let go. And he says, let me go. Let me go. He goes, no, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And he just went boom. And Jacob's hip just went out of socket. <clears throat> was that the blessing? Yeah, I think it was. But it also went along with the blessings that were coming. And the Lord blessed him. That's intercessory prayer where you don't let go of God and you put your faith and trust in him completely that he can do it in spite of who you are, in spite of who you are, and what you've done with his case. Intercessory prayer is warfare. Paul understood this. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We fight against spiritual hosts. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against powers and principalities of the air. When you fight flesh and blood, guess what? You're going to lose. You lose no matter what. And we so often wrestle with men or battle with ourselves when the real fight is with these powers and principalities of the air. We've lost. See, the battle in the flesh will only result in a prideful victory. Think about that one for a second because I had to when I, the Lord gave it to me. Because anytime I have victory in my flesh, I'm like, yeah, I did it. That's pride. That's not dependent on the Lord. We can't do it alone. We need the Lord. Battle in the flesh will only result in prideful victory. The real victory comes in prayer and communion with God. That's when the real victory comes. I know some of you will understand that. You know, when dealing with sin, the victory comes not in fighting the sin, but it comes in fighting the spiritual battle of the flesh and giving in to the Lord. And then the Lord gives you this neat relationship that just oversees the sin. And next thing you know is you're not sinning because you're so in communion with the Lord and you have victory. You're not running around, yeah, I got victory over it. Look at me. No, that's pride. <clears throat> that is pride. <clears throat> Intercessory prayer is a battle within the spirit realm in seeking God. So Jesus and Peter had this intercessory prayer where he prayed for himself, and then God answered him. The battle was there, and the Lord delivered him. And who got the victory? Jesus as they worship him, and they proclaimed him as the Son of God. <clears throat> then we go to verse 36, 34 through 36, as he heals, healed the sick. Let's read it real quickly. And then he, uh, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all the surrounding regions, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched it were made perfectly well. Amazing. Um, so they heard about him, probably heard about <coughs> the healing <coughs> where the woman touched the hem of his garment. That story may have been going around. So they said, hey, Jesus is here. You remember that story about the woman touching the hem? He's out here, and if we just touch his hem, maybe he'll heal us. And they sent everybody, and he did. He healed them all. Jesus up in the mountains praying. There's intercessory prayer. And once you do those things, you get recognized. You are identified as a prayer warrior. And people will know that, that you're the person to go to for prayer. 
That's what a prayer warrior is. It's, it's a term that evangel evangelistical Christians use to a person that's committed to prayer. A person who intercedes means uh, that he intercedes between God and that person. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were intercessory prayers as they prayed along with Daniel for the nation Israel. And we see the power of them as Nebuchadnezzar said, bow down to me. And they said, no, we won't. We only bow down to God. And they threw him into the fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar scratched his head and said, we threw three guys in there, right? Why is there four? Well, there's Jesus in the midst of it all. And they had victory as they walked out of that furnace without even a hair singe nor the smell of smoke on their garments. Another great miracle. Now here's the miracle. As Nebuchadnezzar says, will now worship their God. And anyone that does not worship their God, we'll get rid of them. Wow. That's what intercessory prayer does. That's what prayer does. It moves God in your direction for his glory. <coughs> Person who is willing to commit to daily prayer, heartfelt prayer, practices of prayer, and who is willing to pray alone for others and even strangers will be identified as a prayer warrior. It's a prayer warrior. We, by the way, pray for you. We have someone in the back room praying at each service. And if you'd like to join them, we'd love to have you back there. We have a little room back there, and they get back there, and they pray during the service. Maybe that's something that you'd like to do. You don't have a gift. You don't know how God wants to use you in church. That's a good way to be used. The church needs prayer, a lot of prayer. The world desperately needs prayer. And Jesus is the one that gives us that strength to pray. Let me close up <coughs> just with this little statement. <coughs> when we spend deep and meaningful time with our Father in prayer, intercessory prayer on behalf of, of others, our loved ones and friends and neighbors, and even our, especially those of the household of God, we become prayer warriors. We become prayer warriors against the powers and principalities of this air. We are now in the warfare, and we need warriors like that to fight against these powers and principalities. I have been for 23 years trying to reach this community, and I know a lot of other churches have also. <coughs> and to no avail, it's difficult to reach it. And I don't know if it needs more prayer and fasting or what, but I continue to pray, Lord, why can't we reach this community? And then when we reach it, it seems like they don't stick with it. And that needs prayer. It needs prayer. I don't know why. I don't understand why. But as I said earlier, we take what God has given us and we do with it the best we can and we be faithful with the things he's entrusted to us and we leave the rest in his hands. It's in his hands, not ours. <clears throat> but we need prayer, lots of it. Thank you for for sitting through that. Hopefully you've, you've learned a little bit of something. I haven't exhausted prayer and what it is, but at least three aspects of prayer. And I hope that you'll consider um, <coughs> working at your prayer life and having a more meaningful prayer life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word <coughs> and the challenge that you gave us this morning, Lord, through your word. And what a beautiful story, Lord. We can truly have faith in a God that can do anything. There's nothing that's impossible with you, Lord. I know, Lord, that you don't always answer our prayers. And I know you have your reasons. And you have your workings in our lives. And so we trust in you, even though we don't hear from you all the time. And hopefully, Lord, as we continue to seek you, maybe you will answer us. So help us, Lord, to never stop, to always seek you, and never take our eyes off of you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.